some of you might remember the 2008 January cover of National Ge Geographic. There was this picture of Chicago that had been taken at night from space to show the lights. It's a stunning picture and an alarming one because there is no end to the light. The words on the cover simply say, the end of night, why we need darkness. In that issue, Paul Bogard wrote an article, which he later turned into a book titled, The End of Night, Searching for Darkness in an Age of Artificial Light. He's also done a TED Talk on the same topic. Bogart is from Minnesota, and he remembers as a child being able to see the night sky without any interference from light. He recalls going out in his canoe at night and leaning back across the benches and seeing the Milky Way. According to some research he did, 80% of people in the United States and 60% of people in Europe cannot see the night sky because of light pollution. He goes on to describe why we need darkness. His four main points are that we need darkness and we need the night sky in order to know and understand our place in the universe. We need times of spiritual darkness, no artificial light, so that we can have times of sadness and not knowing or at the very least not understanding what's happening. Because from that place, we seek God or we seek answers or we seek something meaningful. We also, he says, need darkness in order to be creative. We need darkness from a health perspective because we have to fulfill our circadian rhythms and sleep a good cycle. When we don't, our health suffers serious consequences. Bogard claims that most Americans under the age of 40 have never known real darkness. It's time for us to look at our spiritual lives and our spiritual practices from the perspective of darkness. Not from the perspective of white supremacy that says darkness is bad or evil or sinful or scary the perspective of darkness to consider is when darkness allows for and encourages and insists on regeneration and growing and strengthening and giving energy into. And that happens in the dark. You might think of a cocoon or a womb. When Barbara Brown Taylor wrote her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, she confessed that the solar spirituality of most Christian churches does not and has never fit her. Instead, she finds that a lunar spirituality is more descriptive of her faith, which waxes and wanes and is sometimes a little sliver and sometimes a great full moon. She confesses that her greatest periods of spiritual growth and expansion have come from things she has learned in the dark, not from things she learned in the light. The problem, she asserts, is that there aren't many faith or religious leaders 
who teach us to befriend the dark of night, figurati figuratively and literally. When we come into periods where the light seems to have gone out, we panic or we run as fast as we can back into the light or we settle for some false security like a motion sensor light or we lock everything else away in a closet. It's time for me to share with you some of my experience with the dark. When I went away on retreat a couple of weeks ago, I decided to seek out a spiritual guide. I've done that in the past, but it's been some time. What prompted me? What was my felt need? Long before the pandemic began, I have been feeling lost spiritually. I've had this sense that not only do I not know where I am going, I don't really even know where I am. Maybe that sounds funny given that I stand up here each week and preach, but I think it's possible to lead and preach in specific ways while feeling lost personally. The reason I have been this way for a while is that I don't think I was experiencing this place as a crisis, per se. I have simply felt lost. Over the years, I have inhabited many spiritual homes. I've talked with, about that with you before. At some point, I think what's happened is that I left one spiritual home and I have not arrived at another spiritual home yet. I wonder if you've ever had that experience. When you're in a marriage or a partnership or a relationship that breaks up and you know you'll be moving out but you don't know where yet and you realize you don't feel at home anywhere despite having a roof over your head. Or if you have experienced homelessness for a time, you're familiar with this feeling. It's a very uncomfortable state of being. And so most of us tend to head back to the place from where we came or we head a bit too soon to a place we might consider a home. When the pandemic hit and everything changed so quickly, I began to worry a little more about being lost. The spiritual guide I turned to assured me that I am exactly where I need to be. She said, in fact, that I'm not lost, but I'm in a period of time in which there are no edges around me, which is why I thought I was lost. I couldn't find the parameters. I couldn't find the edges. We often use the metaphor of a path for our spiritual lives, and a path has edges, so it's easy to know when you're veering off of the path. Apparently, there is no path for where I am currently, and no edges to be seen. She encouraged me to tune into the deeper vibrations of spirit. She said, you're used to a much higher frequency vibration with great energy. Now is a time to tune into the lower and deeper vibrations of the spirit and gather in the energy that comes from what you hear. And that's what led me to the dark of night. Like Barbara Brown Taylor and so many other children, I grew up being afraid of the dark. In Michigan, where we lived until I was seven, we had great freedom to play outside with other kids in the neighborhood, but only 
until it got dark. Once it got dark and even a little before, everyone was called back inside. Once inside, I was still afraid of the dark outside. I slept with a light on in my bedroom all through childhood. Even as an adult, I would carry a night light with me in case there wasn't enough ambient light at night. My sense of dread would grow as night fell and I could feel fear beginning to subside in the morning as the sun was rising. The sun seemed to scatter all of the evil things that could happen in the night. When we moved from Michigan to California, my family lived on a five acre farm and no longer in a neighborhood and my fear of the dark increased dramatically. There was very little ambient light and in the country, the dark of night seemed much darker. Bad things happened to animals at night, so we had to bring the dogs and cats inside for the night. It wasn't until I was in my 30s that I stopped sleeping with some light. Someone recently asked me to tell them about my experience doing a five-day vision fast. And as I recounted that experience from 1998, I realized that it was the first time I had literally faced my fear of the dark. I was alone in the wilderness with no tent, just a sleeping bag. It was the only time in my life I remember watching as the stars lit up the night one by one. In some ways, it was miraculous. I had no idea how many stars there were. I knew nothing about what happened in the night and had conjured a million fears about all the things that could take place. Facing the onset of dark at night and having to stay in it and staying awake all night and then watching as the dawn broke in the morning was one of the most empowering aspects of my time in the wilderness. I discovered the awe and the magic and the partnership of the dark with the light and without the light, and what happens in the dark when finally the light goes away. I will say it helped that I was not devoured by any wild animals. In the same way, we are invited to face the fear we feel spiritually. If it is possible to befriend the dark of night, surely it is possible to befriend the dark of our spiritual nights. To do that, it's important to remember what Taylor has said. Learning to walk in the dark is an especially valuable skill in times like these. Or maybe I should say remembering to walk in the dark since people of faith have deep pockets of wisdom about how to live through the long nights in the wilderness. Step one is to give up running the show. Next, you sign the waiver that allows you to bump into some things that may frighten you at first. And finally, you ask darkness to teach you what you need to know. Meanwhile, here is some good news you can use. Even when light fades and darkness falls, as it does every single day in every single life, God does not turn the world over to some other deity. Even when you cannot see where you are going and no one answers you when you call, this is not sufficient proof that you are alone. There is a divine presence. 
and all your ideas about it, along with all of your language for calling it to your aid, which is not above using darkness as the wrecking ball that brings all your false gods down. But whether you decide to trust the witness of those who have gone before you, or you decide to do whatever it takes to become a witness yourself, here is the testimony of faith. Darkness is not dark to God. The night is as bright as the day. If I, as a pastor, can learn to accept and even befriend times when I am completely lost spiritually, my hope is that you can too. As people who live in the United States, it's important to acknowledge that our culture is all about denying or fixing or moving away from our pain. We are not a culture that embraces pain of any kind or empowers people in the midst of pain, including spiritual pain. If we were more able and willing to feel pain, to be lost, to experience tremendous discomfort? Don't you think we would be further along in dismantling white supremacy and creating equity across all systems? For those of us who identify as Christian or who at the very least hang out in this community of folks, it's imperative that we learn how to be lost that we learn how to walk in the dark, that we learn how to befriend discomfort and pain within reason because a toothache means you better go to the dentist, not just learn how to live with the pain. And that we open ourselves to knowing less about God than we did when we began. This past week, some of us we're on a webinar that Dr. Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis did on, it was a, another step of how to be anti-racist and how can we build beloved community together. In the first part of the webinar, she had Ruby Sales come on. Ruby Sales, this amazing activist and voice and presence throughout what many of us call the civil rights movement. But part of what Ruby Sales was talking about is why civil rights movement is not the best way to talk about it. She says, what we really are talking about is a freedom movement and we need to call it that because we all need to be free Civil rights movement implies there are some of us who need civil rights. And she said, think about it for a minute. Those of you who are white need to be free from white supremacy in the same way that those of us who are black or persons of color need to be free from white supremacy, and all the systems that have been built on that. So she encouraged us to call it a freedom movement. I think of that when I think about befriending the dark of night. I think about that when I think about facing our deepest fears. I think about that when I feel the experience of being lost spiritually. I am in a movement that is about freedom. God is a God of freedom and desires that every single one of us experience freedom. So all of the things we've been talking about are things that will lead us into 
freedom. One of the things I loved about Paul Bogard's article and TED Talk is that he is adamant that without the dark, we cannot seek or see God in the ways we need to. Bogard also makes the claim that if we cannot stand under the dark night sky without all the security lights around us, we cannot truly know our place in the universe. While the language of darkness needs to be reclaimed as something beautiful and creative and life-giving and strong and nurturing and necessary, so does the actual experience of darkness. So I invite you to spend the rest of this summer looking for a dark night sky without security lights, looking for a chance to be lost and see what comes up for you, looking for renewed energy that comes from the circadian rhythms of light and dark, looking and listening for the deeper tones of the spirit and looking for a way to be yourself if you are in between spiritual homes. Remember the words that Claudia read in Psalm 139 this morning. Wherever we go, even to the farthest limits, there is God. Even when we want to escape, we cannot escape because there is God. When we are feeling lost and afraid, there is God. So let's experience some of the dark of night, literally, and spiritually, so that in the end, we can be in them and be unafraid, or at the very least, be in them and be afraid, but be okay in the fear. Amen.